week, one of the most anticipated films of all time, Avengers Endgame, dropped in theaters. That means today we're going to stop and rank all 22 Marvel Cinematic Universe films from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your ranking of all 22 Marvel Cinematic Universe films. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list, and I would love to see yours down below. Finally, this video is brought to you by Amino. Amino is a totally free smartphone app where you can find tens of thousands of other passionate Marvel fans who love to talk Marvel way too much. If you want to talk about the latest movie or comic book releases, they've got it. You want lively chats? Done. Amino has just introduced a new stories feature. Stories are fun, fast-paced video content created by users like you about all of your favorite topics. You can check them out in the Discovery tab on Amino. If you've ever wanted to post your own video reviews or rankings, this is an easy way to start making videos. Right now, I have an exclusive story in the Marvel Amino sharing my top theories for where the MCU will go in Phase 4. To participate in the Marvel Amino, just click the link down below in the description, follow the prompts to download Amino, Amino for free, and then once you're on there, search for username Sean Chandler Talks About, and you'll find me. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place is Thor The Dark World. This is actually a pretty great addition to the Marvel Cinematic Universe as it falls so far flat that every other MCU film looks better and more interesting by comparison. The tone shifts from Lord of the Rings in space to a rom-com to a buddy comedy to an epic to a tragedy to a melodrama left and right as if the director never hammered out what type of of movie he wanted to make. There's so many directions and plot lines and tones in the movie that they're never able to fully converge. Malkith is easily the most forgettable and boring villain in the entire MCU. He's not given a single defining characteristic or personality trait. We just know he's an evil elf that wants the ether, and we're not really sure why. The movie kicks off with 35 minutes of exposition and setup, yet still as we go into the plot of the movie, Movie, it's still kind of confusing as to why different things are happening, mostly because we don't know why Malkith is doing anything. The movie is so bland that otherwise likable and charismatic actors like Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman have absolutely no on-screen chemistry. It's just a whole bunch of professionally shot, in-focus superhero stuff that doesn't hit the nail on the head. If only we could use the reality stone to fix this movie a little bit. To be clear, even though this movie is last on this list and very mediocre, it still has the MCU polish and it is far from the worst comic book movie of all time. Coming in at number 21 is Iron Man 2. The director and cast do the absolute best they can with a script jam-packed with as many plot lines as the next three MCU films combined. In pre-production, John Favreau said he wanted a three-year turnaround on this movie to be able to get the script right, but the studio demanded a two-year turnaround so that they could get to the Avengers, and this movie suffered for it as they had no time to trim the fat and focus the story. So it ends up being about the government one an Iron Man suit, Whiplash wanting revenge, Justin Hammer wanting to humiliate Stark, Stark's personal and literal toxicity, Stark dealing with daddy issues, oh yeah yeah yeah, and they want to introduce Black Widow and do an Avengers setup. It's a perfect number of plot lines for a full Iron Man trilogy. I don't think that any of these plot lines are particularly bad, but with so many of them crammed into one movie, none of them are developed enough to build any sense of urgency or momentum, and as soon as we get invested in one one, it hops to the next one. If you love to see Tony Stark fighting bad guys in the Iron Man suit, you'll love the last 10 minutes of this movie. For the rest of the movie, we see Tony go into a lab and use his creativity, which adds a new element to the film. Now, I did kind of like Justin Hammer, but unfortunately, they didn't hammer out the details of this script. At number 20 is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now, I know a lot of you love this movie, and I don't want to steal your joy, and I can respect the fact that you love this movie. Hopefully, you can respect the fact that I was really disappointed by this film, and I found it kind of distasteful and poorly plotted. Now, this movie absolutely makes me laugh during sequences, and I can appreciate that James Gunn wanted to make a more character-based film, and Yondu's character in particular benefits from that as he gets a great character arc in some of the best moments. The tone jumps from a cute 
dancing tree, to child torture, to Looney Tunes humor, to patricide in a heartbeat. And the entire thing kind of has a mean streak running throughout it. There's a whole plot line about Drax insulting the appearance of a sensitive girl while she looks uncomfortable as he does it. And there's a main plot line about an orphan who finally meets his biological father only to learn that daddy killed all of his siblings that he didn't know that he had and his mother and then he must kill daddy. That's pretty nasty stuff for a movie that starts with a dancing tree. Because of the delayed ego reveal, the movie doesn't really have a compelling conflict for me until late until the second half of the film. And because of this, for 70% of the movie, ego is just delivering exposition taking naps in playing catch, and then suddenly he's a psycho that we need to stop in the very end. As much as I wanted to love this film, and I really did, it feels a little bit like Gunn's ego got the best of him, and he couldn't quite pull together all these planet-sized villains and themes about family. Real quick, I really like every movie on this list from this point forward, even number 19, I thoroughly enjoy. Number 19, The Incredible Hulk. Given that Edward Norton never returned in the title role and the tonal differences, as well as certain plot lines in this movie are never continued in the rest of the MCU, this film is often treated and seen as the black sheep of the MCU. But I honestly think that most of the hate directed at it is misplaced. Granted, it's at number 19 on my list, so I don't think it's a great movie, but I do think it's pretty enjoyable. First off, I think all the Hulk action in the film is handled really nicely. You get three big action sequences with the Hulk. The first one almost has a horror vibe to it. The second is this daylight sequence against the military, and then you get a full-on boss fight in the end of the film against Abomination, and each of these deliver the experience that they're supposed to. And William Hurt as the convinced military man, as well as Abomination as the evil version of our hero, feel like underrated villains to me. Still, certain parts of the plotline are pretty clunky and certain storylines are abandoned randomly. This is probably due to the fact that the film was extensively reworked in the editing room. It's not as strong as some of the later films on this list and it doesn't smash your expectations, but it's not an abomination either. At number 18 is Thor. Like most films in phase one, it still feels like they're trying to find their Footing. As their first foray into the cosmic realm, it doesn't feel like they totally nail it. Branagh brings his extensive background working on Shakespearean stories to this film, and you get some nice, deep, rich themes about family, betrayal, and legacy. And as soon as the story gets to the earth, there's some real nice fish out of water comedy. While Hemsworth and Hiddleston are still very good in this film, clearly Hemsworth was still trying to figure out Thor's bravado and humor, and Tom Hiddleston plays his role very low key. The tonal shifts between Asgard and Earth never fully gel for me, and as the central conflict deals with Thor's character arc, the movie lacks a certain sense of forward momentum and urgency. While it is pretty good, it never quite makes you go, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! <laughs> Coming in at number 17 is Iron Man 3. This one is another black sheet of the MCU. It works better as a subversive Shane Black film than as a proper MCU film. There's multiple plot lines in here that get abandoned or forgotten by the time you get to Age of Ultron. The movie really does deliver some great things. First off, Shane Black's dialogue fits Tony Stark perfectly. There's some nice rapport between Tony and the kid in the middle act of the film, and there's several really good action sequences in particularly the plane rescue, as well as the climax with all of the Iron Man suits. Now, the movie also has way too many plot lines, just like Iron Man 2. In fact, there's a whole plot line about the vice president trying to kill the president that just seems like a forgettable afterthought. And then you also have the Mandarin twist, where they decided to take a potentially excellent villain and trade it in for a second-rate knockoff of Syndrome. If you're somewhat burned on the comic book genre, you might want to give this one a second watch as it plays against several genre cliches and expectations. But for most people, in its efforts to be clever, Instead of giving us something better, it just gives us something different. And it feels like they never fully ironed out where this movie fits inside of the MCU. Number 16, Avengers Age of Ultron. To follow up the original Avengers, Whedon decided to give us more of everything. The action is bigger, the quips more plentiful, the emotions go a lot deeper, the plot 
way more complicated. When the movie focuses in on the action and the emotions, the moments are just as good as those in the original film, and there's plenty of iconic shots in Whedon zingers. Where the movie struggles is with the story and the storytelling. It moves so quickly from plot point to plot point to plot point that you can't fully follow what's happening, and several times characters' actions aren't explained until several scenes later. For this reason, this is the most confusing film in the MCU for me. Also, Ultron should be this great villain, but something feels off in the execution so he's never as menacing as you think he would be, nor does he make the impact that you're expecting. Much like Cap lifting Mjolnir, this movie can never lift up to the expectations created by the first Avengers. At number 15 is Captain Marvel. This movie feels kind of like an odd addition to the MCU for me. Because of the specific story they told and mistakes it makes, I feel like it doesn't always give off the best first impression. So I'm not really sure if this movie will age well, but what I can say is that it does de-age very well. The best thing about this movie is the 90s setting and young Nick Fury. It's just a lot of fun to see a less cynical, youthful Nick Fury. And who knew that he loved cats so much? Likewise, the movie's 90s setting gives it this very interesting vibe that actually kind of reminded me of the X-Files at times. But there's also a lot of performances here that just feel very weird and off, especially Annette Benning. By making our lead character, Captain Marvel, have amnesia and having characters constantly tell her to restrain her emotions, it doesn't feel like we ever really get to know who she really is or what her personality is like besides feisty. Even her power set is very undefined inside of the film. Like, does she need a helmet to fly in space? As a prequel, there's some nice nuggets sprinkled throughout the film, but most of the connections feel forced or unnatural, and there's at least one plot line that felt like they were answering a question I was not asking with an answer I did not want. While it's still enjoyable, it's a film that feels like it's suffering from the issues that we worked out back in phase one. Coming in at number 14 is Captain America, the first Avenger. This is one of the most frustrating placements for me because I love the first hour of this film as it's telling Captain America's origin story. I love the old-fashioned nobility and heroism. The production design and score are fantastic. And Steve as a hero is very inspiring. And the actual shrinking effects I think they hold up pretty well. But whenever it cuts back to the Red Skull, it slows to a crawl. He doesn't really have much of a story. He's just there to deliver exposition and pick up artifacts. So there's no sense of urgency whenever he's on screen. As you go through the movie, as Steve gets stronger, the movie gets weaker for me. As soon as he rescues the hostages, the movie montages through World War II and just cuts to the climax. It's like they were in such a hurry to get him to the Avengers that they skipped over the whole part about him being a war hero. Now the finale does hit some great notes with Steve and Peggy's final moments before his sacrifice, and the scene in modern times is fantastic. While I do love Steve's origin, the movie itself is a bit uneven. Number 13, Ant-Man. With this film, they tried something a little bit different, a heist movie, and the end results are rather pleasant. It might be one of the smallest scale films in the MCU, but it uses that to its advantage often rather literally. The movie works almost entirely because of how charming the cast is. Paul Rudd basically plays himself as a superhero, but that's a very welcome addition to the MCU. And Michael Douglas adds some nice gravitas to the film, as well as some nice touches of humor. But the real scene stealer is Michael Pena with his energetic stories and infectious storytelling. They also found a way to make the action sequences dynamic and exciting without needing to go large scale. The Thomas the Tank engine sequence being the prime example. But the main plot line and the villain are very reminiscent of Iron Man 1, and this is maybe the least ambitious film on this entire list, though that is kind of part of the charm. If Age of Ultron was the MCU going for a home run and getting a double, this feels like the MCU going for a double and getting a double. Ant number 12, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Coming off of Infinity War, instead of trying to up the ante, they wisely decided to crank up the fun antics, and because of it, they made what is possibly the most lighthearted and fun film in the MCU. After the destruction of Asgard and a king being overthrown in Black Panther and Thanos' snap in Infinity War, it was nice to tell a story in this world that didn't feel like it had the weight of the universe on its shoulders. Paul Rudd is as innocent 
and likable as ever. Michael Pena returns as the scene-stealing storyteller. Michelle Pfeiffer is a nice addition to the story for the little bit of screen time she has. And Evangeline Lilly's Wasp adds some sting to the mix. Some could complain the film has a serious villain problem as our enemies pose an ant-sized threat, but I kind of enjoyed the fact that it's a simple MacGuffin story about different groups swarming on a piece of technology. This isn't trying to be the biggest or the best Marvel movie, it's just trying to tell a fun story, and it does. Some people have asked me to stop with the ant puns. I ant stop. Coming in at number 11 is Doctor Strange. Once again, the MCU found a way to take us in a new, strange direction by introducing us to magic. Of all the films in the MCU, this is probably the one with the most creative and spellbinding visuals. Whether you're talking about the wizard fights, the time bending, the space portals, the city bending, all of it feels like it was stolen directly out of Christopher Nolan's dreams. As always, the film is impeccably cast. Benedict Cumberbatch embodies the air against the sarcasm, the confidence, the brokenness of this character. And Benedict Wong can do no Wong as Wong. That was a pretty fun sentence to say. But this movie feels to me where I can feel the Marvel formula the most, as if they took the Doctor Strange origin story and just squished it through the Marvel origin story template. As much as I like Mads Mikkelsen, his villain is entirely forgettable, and Dormammu is only memorable because that sequence is so catchy. Dormammu? I've come to bargain. Still, the experience of entering Marvel's wizarding world is a real joy and delightful to look at. The next 10 are all films I gave glowing reviews to. This is a little bit like trying to rank my kids, which my wife has told me I need to stop doing in front of my kids. I wish that all 10 could be in the top three, but they can't. So don't freak out on me too bad. I wish Ant-Man would crawl up your butt. And your favorite is too low on the list. Kicking off our top 10 will be Black Panther. Up to this point in time, the MCU had done a heist movie, a wizard movie, a space opera. So why not a soft remake of The Lion King with a few plot points from Dawn of the Planet of the Apes sprinkled in? For me, this is the most serious and thematically rich film in the series. Normally this franchise is about unassuming escapism, but this is a film that had something to say and it told it through story. Now it has its light moments. What are those? But it combines them with a complex story about a king and his kingdom. The real secret sauce here is the main villain, Killmonger. He might have been a villain that needed to be defeated, but in another sense, he won the moral victory and swayed Wakanda. On the flip side, the action and CGI are pretty bland, and the idea of a power suit that can absorb bullet hits and turn them into a power punch is something that my seven-year-old son would come up with. In all the Oscar nominations, seemed like a bit much to me. Overall, this is probably the most mature and grounded film in the MCU, while making room for war rhinos and sneaker puns, which are pretty punny. At number nine is Thor Ragnarok. While Thor the Dark World took him to a literal darker world, this film takes him to a very bright, vibrant, and lighthearted place. Coming off the most mediocre film in the entire MCU, Taika Waititi injected this film with a double dose of humor and energy. From the new characters, to the color scheme, to the score, everything oozes fun and vibrance. The movie is an absolute showcase for Chris Hemsworth's impeccable comedic timing, but everyone is really funny. Jeff Goldblum, well, of course, Jeff Goldblum, Kate Blanchett, Thompson, Korg, all great additions. And since the film is so funny, it's easy to forget that the movie can pack a real emotional punch at certain points in time. But with how high the stakes are and with Asgard getting Ragnarok, the movie frequently undercuts the drama intention with inappropriate uses of humor, and the treatment of the Warriors 3 is just inexcusable. But at the end of the day, this is a thoroughly entertaining film and possibly the funniest in the MCU. Number 8, Spider-Man Homecoming. After a decade of Spider-Man doing this, and fighting this, 
This was such a wonderful change of pace. The first MCU film focused on Spider-Man skips the origin story and goes straight to the high school antics. One of the best things about this film for me was getting a high schooler's take on the MCU and being a hero. Tom Holland plays our title character with such a youthful innocence that it's hard to not kind of get swept up in his infectious charm. And putting Tony Stark as the mentor character in this film allows his character to mature in a new way. And as for things I didn't know that I wanted, Marissa Torme as Hot Aunt May. Good call, Kevin Feige. Like the Ant-Man films, the scale here is pretty small, but unlike those films, our antagonist spins an intriguing web that our hero must untangle. And as a villain, Vulture is a nice surprise inside of the MCU. Instead of being a sociopath out to blow up the world, he's just a guy doing evil things to maintain his family's way of life. While this might not be the most ambitious film in this series, it is one of the most rewatchable films. Coming in at number seven is Captain America the Winter Soldier. Now, I know a lot of you have this as your number one, and it's a great film. It's just not that top tier for me. By making a political thriller, once again, the MCU demonstrated just how much diversity could exist within the franchise. While it has all the fun and adventure and humor and antics that you expect from the franchise, it now adds political intrigue into the mix. Also, by diving into the political realm, they're able to do some of the best world building of the entire franchise, and the twists and turns here have massive implications for the rest of the series. Casting Robert Redford adds a nice touch of respectability. It's nice to see Black Widow get to be more front and center in this film. Falcon is a great addition, and the fights here are some of the best inside of the MCU which all of that makes for one of the best constructed blockbusters of the last 10 years. I don't really have any big critiques of the film. I've never been crazy about the Zola exposition dump and Marvel was unable to buck the trend of bringing dead people back to life. As great as it is, it just doesn't draw out of me as big of emotions as my top six. Number six, Guardians of the Galaxy. When Marvel announced that they were gonna be making a movie about a talking raccoon whose best friend is a talking tree who were on a team led by the lovable chubby guy from Parks and Rec, I thought to myself, Finally, what took so long? Just kidding, I thought they were crazy, but James Gunn poured his heart and soul into crafting this weird set of quirky characters that you instantly fall in love with. As much as this film goes off in weird, bizarre directions, it all seems to work, and each of the characters works on their own, but they're even better together. Add to that, you've got one of the best soundtracks of the 21st century, and you get the MCU film that might have the most personality. For me, this movie was probably one of the top five most pleasant surprises I have ever had in the theater, and I just instantly fell in love with this world in this set of characters. Before I give you my top five, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree, and that's awesome. Let's just do so respectfully. Also, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be updating all of my MCU rankings, the heroes, the villains, all of that fun stuff. You can see it up in this playlist up above. Then starting next Saturday, I'm going to rank all 58 theatrically released Marvel movies from the worst to the best. That's MCU, X-Men, Spider-Man, all of it crammed into one list. This is my magnum opus. I've been working on this project for six months. I'm so excited to finally share it with you. Bringing us into the top five is Captain America's Civil War. One of the things I love about the MCU is Feige's ability to tell standalone stories while interweaving multiple franchises into a cohesive, larger narrative. And Civil War may be the ultimate example of this. It tells its own story while setting up Black Panther and also being a logical follow-up to both Age of Ultron as well as Winter Soldier. The story manages to create a scenario where you would reasonably believe that our hero's competing values would divide the Avengers and the audience. I'm personally Team Cap. How about you tell me down below in the comments? Both sides are right in certain ways and both sides are wrong in certain ways. The cherry on top of all of it is that airport sequence, which is a dream come true for comic book fans. But what holds the movie back from those top spots for me is that Zemo's plan is so convoluted that the only way it could come together the way it does is because the screenwriter said so. Also, given that it's a civil war, the consequences seem a little bit light. But it's got the drama, it's got the action, it's got the humor. Humor. This is another great entry from the Russos. And number four is Iron Man. Rewatching this film now, the lack of pretense and non-stop jokes almost makes this film feel kind of quaint. 
Everything about it feels restrained compared to the current movies. Without the weight of the rest of the MCU on its shoulders, it can focus in on just telling a story about a character. Tony Stark goes into a cave and creates an arc reactor and comes out with this redemptive arc for his character. But the real magic here, as well as in most of the MCU, is that Robert Downey Jr. has incredible chemistry with everyone. He injects every scene with charisma and charm and likability and humor, and he makes everyone else better. The humor flows organically out of their personalities rather than obvious joke setups. Ten years later, it's easy to forget how refreshing this movie was when it first came out. It created the template for the MCU and fun comic book movies. This movie came out the same summer as The Dark Knight, and while I know a lot of people consider The Dark Knight to be the better film, I think this film is a lot more influential. This might be the first film in the MCU, but I still think it's one of the best. Bringing us into the top three is Avengers Endgame. The conclusion to the 11 year long Infinity Saga can truly be called epic. The action is massive, the cast huge, the scope and size bigger than ever, but most importantly, the emotions are deep and rich. Because of where Infinity War left, we get to see our characters and this world in a very different place, and that provides all of our actors to emote in new and deep ways. Beyond that, the Russos take certain characters in some bold new directions, and they're still taking risks this late into the game. Where Infinity War spread the spotlight throughout almost the entire MCU, Endgame trims down the cast to primarily just our original Avengers plus a few additions, so everyone gets a full character arc throughout the film. Throughout the story, they're able to bookend a bunch of the plot lines that we've seen throughout the franchise thus far, and it all leads up to a slam bang finale that somehow manages to top both the airport sequence as well as the Battle of Wakanda. And then as you move into the last 15 minutes of the film, they manage to successfully close out this era of the MCU. In closing, you feel satisfied and you think to yourself, this is a pretty marvelous conclusion. Our runner-up, The Avengers. This film has a certain lightning in a bottle quality to it, as we had never seen a superhero team-up movie like this before, where they took multiple franchises and merged them into one film. Whedon and Feige cracked the code on how to do it right, and multiple other studios have tried to copy the formula and failed miserably. Whedon wisely decided to streamline the story to provide plenty of room for the action and the character interactions. To this day, I think this movie might have some of the best banter and team chemistry. Here we get Loki at his most conniving and menacing, and our post credit scene gives us our first look at Mr. Thanos. Likewise, the third act provides one of the most crowd-pleasing, grin-on-your-face sequences of the entire franchise. And the reason that it works is that each of their characters is given their moments in the spotlight, and it has kind of this aw shucks sense of heroism to it. For me, there's just something special about what they were able to pull off here and it works for me every single time. But coming in in first place is Fantastic Four 2015. With total creative control and a generous budget from the studio, Josh Trank was able to craft a unique vision that he was proud of. Just kidding, how did this movie get in here? And at number one, I think we just got a glimpse of an alternate time stream. But coming in at number one, Avengers Infinity War. After 10 years of buildup and hype, Feige finally dropped the most anticipated film of the entire franchise, and for me, it lived up to the hype. Superficially speaking, it's just incredible to see all of these characters on screen together. Tony Stark with Doctor Strange, Thor with the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thanos with everyone. As a blockbuster, it delivers big laughs, big action sequences, big emotions, massive sequences, and a truly shocking finale. I know some people weren't crazy about where the movie ended, but it absolutely worked for me. But what pushes this film into that number one position is Thanos himself. They managed to craft a villain who's truly menacing because he believes in what he's trying to do, and while you want him to be defeated and his plan is insane, you can kind of see where he's coming from and why he's so broken. This movie has everything that I want from a comic book movie and satisfies me on almost every level. So for me, Infinity War is the best movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you want more rankings like this one, click on that playlist right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.